Welcome back, friends. Welcome back to the Corbett Report. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com coming to you on the 30th of June, 2015, with another edition of Questions for Corbett, specifically episode 23, if you're keeping track at home, and I hope you are. And this is, of course, the monthly podcast series where you send in your questions and I provide some answers. And as always, there are many different ways to get your questions in, perhaps most obviously through the contact form on CorbettReport.com, where you can either leave a text message or you can leave a, an audio message for me via the SpeakPipe application. Of course, you could provide a link to a video sharing site, a YouTube or Vimeo or Dailymotion or whatever of yourself asking the question. Uh, you can tweet me at Corbett Report, uh, and perhaps most importantly, Corbett Report members can leave their questions directly in the comment section of this video uh, post on CorbettReport.com. And this month we don't have any video or audio questions, just a lot of text questions, but a lot of comments uh, in the last month's QFC, a very lively comment section last month. I was very glad to see the discussion happening because, of course, last month I had some questions for you and I wanted to get some discussion going around a couple of the questions I got in. Uh, the question of Cuba and why the normalization of relations right now. There were some very interesting responses in a lot of different directions. For example, uh, Corbett Report user Marie Dara asked uh, if it was possible that relations were always good underneath and that Castro worked for the U.S. and the U.S. helped win the revolution and this was always part of the plan. An interesting proposal, uh, Gufat, um, observes that this is a complex issue that has parallels in what he terms the Latin American light gladio version, where Venezuela was always the crown jewel that they're, uh, they're aiming at, and this is part of that quest to get at Venezuela, the indirect route, I guess. An interesting observation. Again, lots of interesting discussion around that. And also around uh, the question of personal care products and the personal care products of the so-called would-be uh, elite. <laughs> what a terrible term. Um, and there was an interesting link by Octium to the Guccifer email hack, uh, which included a hack of a uh, some Rockefeller spawn uh, personal email account that included lots and lots of pictures of the Rockefellers' family, family vacations and family get-togethers. And I thought that was really interesting. I hadn't seen those pictures before, so thank you, Octium, for that link. And it shows that uh, the only branded um, products that they have in those pictures are beer and bottled water. Everything else is handmade, um, home prepared, I'm sure by a team of chefs, uh, personal chefs. But anyway, just an insight into the, the sort of personal products that are used or not used by these, uh, well, elite is the wrong word. Scumbags would probably be a better word. But that's to editorialize, isn't it? Anyway, a lot of very interesting discussion in the comment section, so thank you to all the Corporate Report members for that. And of course, lots of questions uh, from last month that we'll get to. But first, let's open up the mailbag, and we'll go on to, uh, to a question directly from uh, Liam via email. He writes, In a recent article by Antiwar.com, it discusses the recent charges laid on a CIA whistleblower who leaked information about Operation Merlin, the CIA operation to give faulty nuclear designs to the Iranians. More interestingly, James Risen's book, State of War, alleges that the operation actually aided the Iranians in their nuclear program. Is Iran as a nuclear threat actually a false flag, and is the CIA covering its tracks? Thank you for that email, Liam. It's a very perceptive question, and this is an interesting story. People might have heard of this story because of the verdict that was handed down against Sterling, I believe, uh, two years in jail. Um, he was facing a potential 24 years in jail, so Jesselyn Raddick of the Government Accountability Project said it's the least worst outcome that they could hope for. <laughs> Take that for what it's worth. But there was a lot of talk about the, the whistleblower aspect implications of that case, but not what he actually blew the whistle on, which is this Operation Merlin, this operation back um, 15 years ago, where the CIA was f handing the Iranians planting false uh, air, uh, nuclear weapon designs on the Iranians to lead them down false blind alleys in their nuclear program so that they wouldn't develop a nuclear weapon. But of course, as as Liam points out, James Risen makes the, uh, the, the accusation that these false designs actually did help Iran, Iran get on the right track in terms of their nuclear program. Take this all for what it's worth, and I did just write about the nuclear program in my latest International Forecaster editorial. I'll put the link in the show notes so you guys can check that out for yourselves. But I think the idea that the uh, CIA, in trying to mislead the Iranians, was in fact actually trying to lead the Iranians is not actually a, a crazy theory at all. There are 
historical precedence for that sort of thing. Perhaps the most obvious is the proliferation of nuclear weapons to the Pakistanis. How did Pakistan get the bomb? That is a fascinating story that, of course, involves complicity of the CIA in basically knowing about and observing and, and looking at the uh, the network of the uh, the, um, the 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 nuclear insider who was feeding this information to the Pakistanis and continually not only not busting them but actively protecting that network as was uh, brought out by whistleblower Richard Barlow. And I go into that in an eye-opener report that was released a while ago called uh, Nuclear Secrets, How America Helped Pakistan Get the Bomb. Um, yes, I mean, the U.S. has time and time and time again been actively involved in complicitly aiding other states to get their nuclear weapons, including, of course, the Israelis. So, uh, I mean, the idea that they are actively trying to help the Iranians along with their nuclear program as a false flag so that they can then set them up and say, hey, look, they've got a nuclear program. Uh, that is not at all, I think, uh, uh, an out there on the limb theory. I think that's very, very, very plausible. All right, let's move on to the comment section of last month's video where we had this good question from Buddha Force. In the U.S., the Senate Select Intelligence Committee is supposed to have oversight on the intelligence community. This includes potentially being briefed on covert actions, at least according to the official website. My question is, do you think any of these members wind up getting involved in intelligence com community activities? I've been wondering about this ever since John McCain recently popped up in Ukraine, Libya, Syria, and other places, meeting with key people where we suspect intelligence operations and covert actions are taking place. Is it just a co coincidence, or is there something more? I can't help but think about Fletcher Prouty's insight on how the secret team planted people into the military and let them move up into higher areas to gain more control. Excellent observation, Buddha Force, and I think you do obviously point out the uh, the implications of this. I mean, it's it's not only likely, I think it's almost unfathomable that that at least key members of these intelligence committees are not in fact covertly in the intelligence community itself. Um, and not again, not everyone who sits on one of these committees is necessarily uh, secretly CIA, but I'm sure that the, uh, the the upper positions almost certainly always are. And one, I think, case study that highlights that phenomenon is Porter Goss, who uh, in his junior year at Yale, the CIA stomping grounds, was recruited into the CIA. This is his official biography. There's nothing secretive here. He was recruited into the CIA in his junior year at Yale. And, uh, and so throughout the 1960s and early 1970s, he was actually, he was a part of the agency. He was an agent. And then he retired from the CIA, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, retired from the CIA in the early 70s, and he went on to become a mayor. And then he was appointed by the governor of Florida, Bob Graham, to head up a certain committee, and then he got elected to Congress. And, uh, and then he, as a congressman, he eventually became the head of the uh, House Intelligence Committee in 1997, which he served until 2004. And then um, after that, he became the director of central intelligence. So um, so it, it, it's just one big long intelligence career with this retirement break in the middle and heading up the House Intelligence Committee. I think we can take that for what it's worth, which is that, yeah, Porter Goss, I'm sure, was in one way or another, maybe not explicitly on the payroll of the CIA during his retirement, but was working for the agency, more or less, from within government itself. Uh, and look at the other connection there, Bob Graham giving him a key appointment um, in his early political career. And Bob Graham, of course, goes on to become the Senate Intelligence Committee head during that same period that uh, Porter Goss was the House Intelligence Committee head, which just happened to coincide with, oh yeah, 9-11. And what was Bob Graham and Porter Goss doing on 9-11? Oh, they were breakfasting with Mahmoud Ahmed, the head of the ISI, the Pakistani ISI, uh, breakfasting as the towers uh, are, are being destroyed. So you know, take it for what it's worth. These people are clearly intelligence operatives of some sort. And again, it doesn't mean they're explicitly on the payroll, but they are absolutely working in tandem with the intelligence community. And so the idea that their oversight uh, is going to be effective of these agencies is ridiculous and I think falls flat on its face. That's just one example. I'm sure there are many, many more that we could look at. But yes, I think it's almost certain that these people are Again, certain key members of these committees are actually in the intelligence community. Okay, let's move on to Bub Romer, who had a comment on the last QFC. 
What in the end is the rationale for endless economic growth? I read in this charming ebook, The Organic Economy, and he provides a link, that countries need growing economies in order to pay interest, pay back interest on debt money issued by banks in the form of loans, i.e. funny money, which funny money can only be paid back by the principal money created by people's honest labors, hence work propaganda by the system. Is this too crude a simplification? Is it also true to say that when a country's economy stops growing, it can no longer pay interest on the funny money issued by the banks and hence collapses? It's broadly, I think, correct-ish, um, but it is more subtle than that. There is there is some more complexity to it. So I co constantly go back to the money is debt series, um, which was, I'm sure people who have been around for at least a decade in the alt media have probably seen this. It's a It started out money is debt, I believe it was just a 45 minutes or so um, cartoonish type documentary. I mean, it was a cartoon style, but it uh, goes into some of the, the, the fact that money is created as debt in our economy and what that means. Money is Debt 2 expanded on that, and Money is Debt 3 really expanded on that. And each iteration of that series, most people have seen Part 1, not, not a lot of people have seen Part 2, probably no one's seen Part 3. It starts getting more and more in-depth and complex. It's a really, really, really very fascinating series, but it uh, by Part 3, it, it requires a lot of attention. Uh, it really starts to get into the intricacies of it. So people might remember from the original Money is Debt, there's the picture of the treadmill, or I, I believe is one of the images where... The money is created as debt, um, so you have the principal being created, but it's owed back as principal plus interest. So there's the people on the treadmill trying to get the loans as they're coming out of the tube, and they have to pay back the loans plus the interest. So they have to get more money than is actually being created to put it back in the tube to, to extinguish the debt. And so someone is going to lose in that game. Someone's going to be left holding the bag, and they're going to fall off the treadmill, i.e. go bankrupt. And that just seems hardwired into the system. Money is Debt 2 goes into some more detail to show that the, the people who support the system have a way of arguing that the system as a whole is, in fact, sustainable, and, in fact, it has 100% recycling of the money supply. Although we should take that with a huge grain of salt. Is charging interest really a sin? While today it seems very reasonable to charge for the use of money, there's a simple and unavoidable problem with doing so. Unless moneylenders spend every penny of interest they receive in such a way that the borrowers can earn it again, the borrowers are going to come up short regardless of their hard work and personal virtues. Someone will default simply as a result of the arithmetic. This is easy to picture where there's a fixed money supply like gold coin. As long as all of the coins taken in as interest are spent so that the borrowers can earn them, the same coins can be used to pay the interest over and over. The lender can profit by buying real things with this coin, but the coin itself must be spent, not lent nor removed from circulation. Leaving aside any moral considerations, this arrangement would be sustainable. However, if the interest coins are re-lent at interest or removed from circulation by hoarding, there will be an inherent shortage of coins with which to pay off the aggregate debt. The situation is essentially no different in our current debt-based system. As we have seen, nowadays virtually every dollar comes into existence as debt, with a scheduled appointment to be extinguished as a principal payment on the loan that created it. Thus, for all borrowers to be able to make their payments of principal plus interest, two things must be true. The dollar created as the principal of the loan must be available to be earned by the borrower in order to make the principal payment that extinguishes that dollar. And, Every dollar the borrower pays to the bank as interest must also be available to be repeatedly earned by the borrower so that it can be paid as interest again and again. There is a common theory, undoubtedly popular with lenders, that because the banks spend their interest earnings as operating expenses, interest to depositors and shareholders' dividends, there is in fact enough money released back into the community to make all payments. However, like the idea of absolute shortage, this is an oversimplification. 
Picture what happens if someone else, such as you or I or an institutional non-bank lender, obtains this dollar and then lends it out at interest. Well, now that same dollar is simultaneously owed to two lenders and has two simultaneous interest charges attached to it. In addition, if this dollar is loaned, repaid, and reloaned by the secondary lender, it is not available to pay off the principal of the loan that created it, except as another loan. So, can we borrow from Peter to pay Paul and borrow from Paul to pay Peter? This gets interesting. We can. However, each time money is borrowed, there's an interest charge added that also must be paid. If all added interest charges can be earned, all payments can be made. On this basis, many economists and defenders of the current system claim there can never be a shortage of money and all payments can be made. But this seems to be a false assurance. For instance, if secondary lenders capture some of the money needed to retire the loan that created that money, the original loan can never be retired. The deficiency will have to be borrowed over and over forever, each time at interest. Each deficiency will be cumulative, adding to an ever-building total of debt that can never be paid off. All right, I hope the point is taken that it is more complex than the simplistic picture would put it, but in the end, maybe it results in about the same thing. And yes, there are proponents of the, and advocates of the current system who would make the, the case that this uh, current system is, if you look at it on the macro level, it is recycled and sustainable and it's oh, it all it's so virtuous. But uh, when you actually drill down into the details, that is obviously not the case. I think, as we can see from our reality of growing, increasing debt levels at all sectors of society and what that does to the average person. And I hope you will continue watching Money is Debt 2 and Money is Debt 3 to see the system that Paul Grignon propo proposes, which I think is the most ingenious system I've seen um, proposed yet. And again, there's a lot of detail and intricacy here, but it is worth knowing about because I don't think there's anything more fundamental to our existence than the question of what is money? Where does it come from? Where should it come from? How should it be created? Or should it be created at all? Anyway, lots to talk about there, but we'll leave it there and move on to the next question from Oda Benga, who writes, I've read that Russia and China combined hold enough US paper, money plus debt, to crash the dollar and the US economy at will. Is this true? If it is, why do they put up with the absurd belligerence of the neocon crazies? Uh, all right, well, this is a good question. I'm not sure I can exactly quantify the dollar holdings, the reserve dollar holdings of these countries, um, because they usually list reserve assets, um, just generally speaking, not breaking them down by holding. And then even then, what, what cash holdings do they have, etc. So that's a difficult thing to quantify, but we can quantify treasury holdings, at least according to the treasury website. China, $1.26 trillion of treasuries. Russia, $66.5 billion. China, the largest treasury holder, um, always competing with Japan for that spot. Russia, quite far down that list, a rel relatively insignificant $66.5 billion in treasury. So China is, I think, clearly the, uh, the key factor there. And could they crash the dollar if they just dumped all those treasuries at once, for example? Well, I don't think the dumping of those treasuries all at once would necessarily and by itself crash the dollar because ultimately the current system is based on the US dollar as the world reserve. Everyone needs it. And plus it's the petrodollar. Everyone, almost everyone uses it in almost every transaction, although that is changing in almost every oil burst. So um, it is still the bedrock of the global monetary order. And as such, you know, there's it never goes out of style. People always want to buy up U.S. government debt and U.S. dollars will always have a home somewhere in the current monetary order, which, as I say, is changing. So it, that would certainly be a very significant event towards the destabilization of that monetary order, but it wouldn't by itself overnight completely scuttle the, uh, the, the U.S. dollar or the U.S. economy. Um but having said that, I, I guess the underlying question is, well, why why is China and, by its adjunct, I guess in this game, Russia, in some way sustaining this system by, for example, buying U.S. treasuries? 
And this goes, of course, to the heart of the 3D geopolitics that I've been looking at for the last year or two here on the Corbett Report and looking at China and the New World Order and how they factor in. And I think a good example of the shenanigans that undergird the system, the reason why China couldn't and wouldn't dump all their U.S. holdings all at once um, in the current system is because they are economically so tied into the American economy that I think it would be disastrous for China. Now, there are, of course, there are ways that they may be maneuvering to try to survive that type of cataclysm with their however many thousands of tons of gold holdings they really have and their move towards the creation of uh, alternative institutions. But uh, but still, to get a sense of how tied in Russia and China are to the uh, American-led monetary economic financial world order as it exists now, I would recommend a site newworldorderg20.wordpress.com that has a lot, of, I mean, just it, it, it has tons and tons of stories talking about the various deals between Western corporations and, and Russian and Chinese interests, and that goes to all sectors of industry, all sectors of society, um, and should be no surprise to people who understand that, again, the brick side of this equation is just another side of the same globalist game and they're all playing the same agenda for the same purposes and they're all cooperating together economically and financially but this site documents that or at least it was documenting that and unfortunately I see there have been no updates to this site since mid-May I certainly hope it is going to continue because it is a valuable resource but I, I suggest people just browse through some of those stories to see how intimately linked in Russia and China are to the western corporate oligarchy and financial oligarchy. So I don't think they want to do that. And I think that's part of that, <coughs> excuse me, that 3D chess game that we've talked about before. Okay, next question. Maurice Burke 88 writes, recently over the last year or so, there seemed to be a great push by corporations to acquire other corporations. Massive amounts of mer money spent on mergers, example, FedEx buying TNT. Is there a reason behind all these massive mergers at once? Or is it just a phase with no underlying reason. Well, usually there is a reason for this type of activity, and we can document this activity. This is, is a real phenomenon. Uh, for example, NPR, Comcast Time Warner deal tops a year of corporate mergers, noting that uh, there were $3 trillion worth of deals, mergers and acquisitions deals, announced um, this year, that's 2014. Uh, the biggest year for mergers and acquisitions since the financial crisis, and the trend is expected to continue next year. So there definitely is a trend of increasing mergers and acquisitions, and it's interesting when you map uh, mergers and acquisitions over the years. For example, I'll throw in a link to a chart showing M&A over the past uh, 20 years in North America specifically. Look at that chart and look at the time when number and valuation of those M&A deals peaks. You have a peak in 99-2000, right before the dot-com bubble bur burst. You have a peak in 2006-7, right before the subprime housing bubble burst. And it looks like we're reaching another peak right about now, 2014-15. Line those dots up, if you will. Um, I, I think, yes, so there is a reason why mergers and acquisitions occur in these times. It's because all the money that's created in these bubble times starts to flood into the stock markets and starts to increase the valuations of these various companies. And with the extra capital that they have sloshing around, these companies are looking at ways to expand their profits for their shareholders. So they start buying other companies. And that's the, the sort of consolidation that we see right before the bubble pops and it all falls apart. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now. So I think this is another worrying sign that we're reaching the top of this bubble, this bond bubble, which as I've pointed out before, I'll point it out again, one of the uh, the deputy chiefs of the Bank of England pointed out a couple of years ago, the bond bubble is the largest bubble ever created in history. It is a man-made bubble and it is, you know, when it bursts, it's going to be exceptionally messy. So it's something to keep in mind and that's another angle into that story. Uh, let's move on to Renaus, who had a very interesting question via email. He says, I hear you refer to the term globalist and globalism many times, and I think I understand that you're referring to the UN and the laundry list of trade agreements being put forward to consolidate power into the hands of the few. I am, al I am although a little bit conflicted because I see tremendous benefits in the free flow of information, products, and services between people all around the world, regardless of which country it is from. With the division of labor allowing more and more people to concentrate on things they are at best at and providing the individual with products at much lower cost. 
I would love to see a world without taxes and tariffs on products crossing borders in a truly P2P fashion. This could be defined as a form of globalism, since trade between individuals, regardless of borders, would naturally expand. Will probably never happen for political reasons. When you use the term globalism, do you also refer to this phenomenon of market economy? A very good question, a very astute question, Renaus, and thank you for bringing this up, because I do often just use the term globalism or globalist, which, like any single word to refer to an entire ideology, is going to be uh, inadequate to really encompass that ideology and all of its implications and iterations. So the word itself, if we just use that word in isolation, it sounds like that the idea that we're opposing here is just the idea of the globe you know, being treated as an entity, you know, in one in one fell swoop. But I think that's not quite the right way to look at it. And it's interesting because of that, the way that this is framed, people usually posit that the answer to globalism must be nationalism. We must preserve the nation state against this globalist framework. I argue that's the exact phony false dialectic that pushes us towards the globalist logic inevitably because i think it is the exact same trend of of colonies or states or various political entities coming together to form federal governments and federal governments coming together to form regional governments and regional governments coming together to form global government that is the logic of this centralization of political power the nation state is just one stage in that so yes in terms of moving forward or moving backward along that that path of centralization i guess the nation state is less centralized than the global government but it's still part of that same logic of centralization of control I think we have to eschew completely that dialectic for what should be the real answer to globalism, which is decentralization. So in that context, obviously myself as a voluntarist, I don't believe in these things called borders, which are just lines on a map decided by people who wear funny hats and badges and claim that they have authority over geographical areas. Um, I, silly, it's meaningless. So in a truly free world, I'm not going to be arrested for stepping across some imaginary line on a map without the proper documentation from the right person, the, the king, the queen, giving me, you know, the, the pass to, to, to go from one place to another. Just absolutely ridiculous. But, uh, but obviously we live in that system right now. So when I talk about globalism, I'm talking about the ideology, the idea that there should be this centralization of power and control, and obviously that's for the benefit of the very few who are going to be controlling that system, not for the masses. Um, and that's just baked into the cake of that globalist ideology. And this is put forward in the, the construction of, as you mentioned, the, the United Nations and its associated institutions, the types of trade agreements we see coming along, etc., that are within that globalist framework. So look at something like the TPP or the TTIP or these types of trade deals that are in vogue at the moment. Uh, these are to be uh, avoided and, and detested and, and protested because they are within that status framework where this is about the ways that individual nation states will cooperate in uh, to, to set regulations or what have you to put that framework on, uh, that's currently controlling nation state economies into regional agreements that will eventually become global agreements. And we see that in things like the World Trade Organization. And, and that's to be rejected because it is part of that centralized control status framework that is just following its own logic and continuing to expand. We have to eschew that entirely for what could truly be actually really truly free trade be between free humanity with no borders and free human beings trading whatever way they like with anyone they like in the world, which would be the ideal, the real obvious the, the actual uh, dialectic there, not between globalism and nationalism, but between globalism and decentralized framework of non-statist controls, no controls in that sense. Um, that is what we should be aiming for. So that is the true dialectic. And so it's really difficult to encapsulate that in the word globalism. So I agree, we should be careful about using that word and assuming we know what it means when we're not really thinking it through. I did write an edit series of editorials for The Forecaster earlier this year talking about these ideas that culminated in an article called Defeating the Globalists. I'll put the link in the show notes so you can 
uh, read that one. And I suggest you read some of the ones preceding that to find out more about it. But that shows, I think, that the idea of globalism versus nation state is the false dialectic that will inevitably lead towards the global government, because that's the logic that's baked into that argument. So lots to say there. Perhaps we'll have to explore that in future episodes. But let's move on to another comment, this time from Studio 27. Recently, I noticed a story about a government agency, NIST, NIST, initiating a call for technology to identify tattoos. Here where I live, Portland, Oregon, you cannot go 10 feet without crossing the path of an inked human. My question, James, is do you think that the ever-increasing fad to get a tattoo has been orchestrated in some way to identify and target citizens, not just hardened criminals as they claim? All right, well, eh, that's a very that's a very specific question with very broad implications, and I can't really answer that. Do I have any information that this has been orchestrated? No, not directly. So I can't speak to that specifically. If there is any information out there, please do share it in the open source investigation. I'd be interested to take a look at it. Um, but it certainly, uh, regardless of whether it's been orchestrated or not, or in what level or in what way, the idea of putting identifiable... Uh, marks on yourself that will make you instantly identifiable and stand out from a crowd is obviously going to be very good for those agencies that are looking for ways to try to identify individuals and crowds. So, you know, it's giving them a helping hand anyway. And I find that to be interesting. And I mean, just as an aside, look at something like the, uh, the, the, the Richard Lee Guthrie, uh, uh, Kenneth Trenadu, John Doe number two story from the OKC and the, the dragon tattoo on the arm being part of that mix-up in identities. It's interesting, anyway, to, sit, to think about the ways that that can be used by law enforcement. Um, having said that, uh, if these face-scanning technologies and the like aren't just pure hype that they're trying to use to scare you and, of course, bilk money out of the agencies that are promoting them, if they actually do live up to their promise of being able to identify people by their biometric details, you know, through face scanning cameras at a great distance, then I guess it's all a moot point anyway, because we'll all be instantly identifiable. But um, again, uh, I don't know. I, 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 again, as a voluntarist, if you want to put ink on your body, great. I don't, but, you know, go for it, do it. But, uh, but be aware that it could be used in systems that are being worked on to try to identify people via their tattoos, via computer algorithms that will be fed into these cameras that scan everything. It's just part of the panopticon. So be aware of that at any rate. All right, let's move on to Batcha, who writes, Hi, James. Recently, I saw a video from Rise Together, whose blog I have found informative, suggesting that Swiss Indo is a solution for our financial problems. Did you hear about this? Is it complete bogus, another disguise solution for the NWO, or indeed a possibility to solve our enslavement to the current monetary system? I've looked into this uh, not thoroughly, and I haven't done great deals of research on it, because quite frankly, I find it to be utter gobbledygook about someone calling himself mr1mr.a1.sino.as.s2ir Sogil Hartanognegro ST, who believes himself to be the 681st King of Kings, who is using the title M1, which he claims has significant meaning, meaning saying that there's a delegated hereditary trust of all precious metals that are locked in vaults or buried throughout the Indonesian archipelago that he has access to, that he's going to suddenly bestow on humanity. Everyone will get... Uh, however, X many mil millions of dollars overnight, and you don't have to do anything for it. You, it's just going to suddenly appear because he's going to release this to all of humanity. Um, I find that to be nonsense, gobbledygook. It's there's uh, it, it's saying that this is all based on scriptures and things like this, and and uh, there's no documentation except for you know insiders who have. There's documents from the inside that show the flowchart of the power structure of this supposed hereditary trust that supposedly exists, but it literally is just a document that could have been typed up by anyone anywhere, and there's I mean, there's nothing to it. Uh, there, there was supposedly some sort of coronation of this M1 whatever um, last year with all the world leaders attending. Of course, there's no... There's no proof of any of this. It's just a bunch of stuff that people are saying. And hey, I hope it's true. Wouldn't it be wonderful if some person's going to come from the skies and just give you bajillions of dollars and rain it all down on everyone and all the problems of the world will be solved? Um, well, actually, if you're 
familiar at all with any economics, just giving everyone $6 million overnight or whatever will not actually help matters because then if everyone's a millionaire, no one's a millionaire, if you know what I mean. But anyway, uh, there's so much to say about that. But again, if there is some, you know, this is something that comes up in the alt media um, quite a bit. There's always some secret trust or some secret organization, some secret band of ninjas that's going to assassinate all the Illuminati tomorrow or what have you and save the world. And I find it fascinating that people tend to believe these stories, but um, I personally don't put any stock or faith in them. I don't sit there hoping for this to happen or waiting for it to happen. If it happens, great. But why would I, why would I even waste my time researching this? Because I don't have to do anything for it. It's just going to suddenly appear. So great. Wonderful. So the world will all be solved. All the problems of the world will be solved overnight by something that most people don't even know exists. Great. Wonderful. But uh, again, I don't think it's worth my research time to look into it. I'm always open to being persuaded otherwise. If people have something they find really compelling about this case, please share it with me but I just find it a complete nonsense and uh, I haven't seen anything worth even looking into with regards to it. Uh, let's move on to an email from Rachel. Uh, you recently mentioned the documentary Princes of the Yen and yet you said there were things about it that you did not go along with. I wondered if you could go into a bit more detail. Uh, yes, last month's QFC we talked about the Princes of the Yen documentary. I did recommend it um, because it is a really great descriptive analysis of the bubble years of Japan, what really caused that, how it was really engineered by this, the Bank of Japan through window guidance. Uh, an excellent descriptive analysis, really fascinating, a really important part of history, monetary history, not just for the Japanese, but really for the world. And, uh, and a great case study in what can happen with this type of central bank engineering and uh, the decades of squalor of the, the increasing depredation of the Japanese economy that we've seen as a result of the popping of that bubble. It's uh, very important, very fascinating, and a great descriptive analysis. But as I said, what they go on to suggest proscriptively, I am not really on board with. I'm not really enthusiastic about. Um, there's a section where they talk about, well, what the Bank of Japan could do is just basically rain money from heaven. They could just print up paper money, give it to the banks to take on their toxic assets in one form or another. And they say there's, you know, multiple different ways of doing it, just like QE or like... Uh, uh, creating a bubble in a specific industry or sector and then letting the banks pile into it to, to get profits or, you know, just paying the banks directly or whatever it, it may be. Um, so the Fed, the Bank of Japan, in this case, can just rain money down from heaven and solve the problem. And I, I get from within the framework and logic of the system as it exists, how that is, in fact, the only real thing that these central bank institutions can be doing to prevent the contraction of the money supply and the deflation that's going to cause a lot of depredation. I get that within the logic of the system, but I think it's the logic of the system itself that is the problem. It's the central banks themselves. It's their existence that is the problem, not the solution. So you're not going to find the solution by, oh, if, if the central bank just acted like this, then it would all be solved. I think that's the wrong way to approach it. So I get what they're saying. And again, take a look for yourself and decide for yourself. But personally, I'm not convinced by that argument. I don't think it's the best way to frame that. I don't think it's the best way to talk about it. Um, so perhaps I should do it myself and say what I would do. So maybe there will be a, a, a episode in the future about that. All right, let's move on to Gerben, who has a comment. Very recently, I'm discovering alternative coverage about ancient Egypt, a documentary series named The Pyramid Code, which has been bundled on YouTube and named A Different Story About Ancient Egypt and Our Origins, raises and suggests answers to some very interesting questions. I'd like to know if you did any coverage on such, such topics whatsoever, and if not, do you have any thoughts you'd like to share on this topic, and or would be willing to do coverage on such topics? All right, good question. Um, personally, I think this is a bit beyond the purview and remit of the Corbett Report. Ancient history is fascinating. It's important. I hope people who are interested in it are looking into it, do look into it. That's great. It's important. I just am not versed in this at all. I'm not a specifically ancient historian type of person. I don't have any uh, familiarity with the, the languages that would be necessary and, and the detailed history. 
it's a very, very detailed and complex subject that I think is just way beyond the scope of what I'm doing here at the Corbett Report. Uh, having said that, I'm, I'm fascinated by the subject as well, but just from a layman's perspective, uh, I haven't seen this pyramid code, um, but I did add it to my must-watch list when you recommended it, so thank you for that, Gerben, but I haven't gotten around to it. You should see my must-watch list. It's miles long at this point. So, um, so I don't personally have anything profound to say on this subject. If people out there in the audience do, please contribute to this open source investigation. Ideas, comments, links, anything you have. This is a question for you in the audience. And so Gerben or anyone else, if you have more information or more thoughts about this subject, please do bring it up. Um, as I say, it's important. It's interesting. It's just kind of beyond what I'm doing here at the Corbett Report. All right, um, let's move on to at Sea Devil on Twitter who asks, how would you make a fictional movie about issues you care about without making it seem like predictive programming? Thank you for that question, Etsy Devil. That is a deceptively simple, but I think deceptively really, really important question when it comes to this question of creating fiction um, about these types of issues from a truth perspective even. How do you do that without it becoming a predictive programming prescription for the very thing you're trying to avoid? It's a very, very subtle question. So I'm going to open it again. This is a question for you, for the audience out there. Please tell me your thoughts on this. I, in some way, I think this is one of the fundamental questions of my film literature New World Order podcast series generally. And for people who don't know, who haven't subscribe to that. that. That's a monthly podcast where we look at different books and movies every month to try to look at predictive programming and these, these issues that come up in fiction about and how they relate to the, the new world order, generally speaking. And I don't know if I have a good answer to that because, I mean, when you write it from a perspective where you're trying to warn people, like I think Orwell really was in 1984 trying to warn people about the consequences of what he saw developing. But does it become a type of predictive programming? Or have we been uh, in some way at least introduced to and made comfortable with some of the ideas of the Big Brother police state and given the idea that it's a sort of inevitability simply by being introduced to them? And there's the question of propaganda. I mean, can you argue for something without it being a type of propaganda? Uh, there's always some aspect of when you're arguing for something, you're constructing an argument for something. There is an aspect of propagandization that goes on there. Can that be avoided? Should it be? I mean, how does how do you how do you deal with that within the framework of creating a work of fiction or a movie or what have you? Again, a very interesting question. So I'll let people uh, talk it out in the comment section, and I'd be interested to hear your responses. And finally, uh, at Leprechaun 1984 uh, tweets. I hear you're coming to Canada soon to visit family. If you're in Calgary, would you be interested in a meet and greet? Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, I would be interested, but having said that, we are going to be in Canada for a grand total of 10 days, chop a day off at the beginning and the end for travel days. That's really eight days of actually being there and being ridiculously jet lagged with a two-year-old in tow, trying to squeeze in family, friends, sightseeing, sightseeing, and shopping, which my wife wants to do. Hey, it's Canada. Uh, so there is absolutely no way that we're going to be able to squeeze in anything like that this time around. But I certainly do hope and trust that that will occur at some point in the future. I would love to do a meet and greet in Canada and meet some of uh, the Canadians out there, um, but not this time. So thank you for that. And yes, for those who don't know, yes, I'm pre preparing right now to go on that trip to Canada. In fact, right now, as I record this, I am preparing to do a little trip here in Japan. I'm doing an interview for GRTV, and I'm talking to some book publishers here in Japan. So I'm going to be gone for most of the rest of the week. I have a video and an article and some things that will be coming out while I'm away um, to keep you tidied over. And then next week, we're going to be going to Canada. So uh, for the next couple of weeks, few weeks, really, the Corbett Report's going to be quieter than usual. Please don't freak out or panic when that happens. Uh, there's going to be a couple of subscriber newsletters that uh, will not be coming out as I'm away for that vacation. Um, so it will be quiet and just hang on. I know I always get emails when, whenever there's a, any type of summer hiatus or anything like that from people. Where are you? What's going on? So don't freak out. Yes, I'm going away for a few weeks, but I'll be back towards the end of July and we will continue on from there. 
Speaking of continuing on, I think that's all we have time for today because I am literally in the midst of packing. I have my bags around me as we speak, and uh, I don't have time to answer even a fraction of the, th the questions that come in on a monthly basis. But I do appreciate your comments, your questions, and your interactions. Again, please do keep them coming in, and please check CorbettReport.com for the latest updates. I think we're going to leave it there for this month. Thank you again for your participation in today's exploration. And please go to CorbettReport.com for the show notes. This is James Corbett, CorbettReport.com. Talk to you again real soon. The Corbett Report presents Laughing at Tyrants, the latest DVD from the producer of on the morning of September 11th, 2001, 19 men armed with box cutters directed by a man on dialysis in a cave fortress halfway around the world. And... Well, today on the How To Podcast, we tell you how to foil your own terror plot. And... But that's called the death panel, uh, and you're not supposed to have that discussion. Shut up, conspiracy theorist. Twelve of the funniest Corbett Report videos on one video DVD. Buy one for yourself or share it with a friend. Because the best way to disarm a dictator is to laugh at